You don't need a luxury kitchen to prepare gourmet meals. My name is Dennis. I live in a mobile home in a trailer park, and this is my kitchen. I want to make something today that I saw on a list. I got on the internet and I looked up a list of what were the 10 most popular foods in the world. And I, at the top of the list were things that I expected to see there, like ice cream and pizza, and hamburgers and fries. But I was surprised to see chicken tikka masala. I've heard of it, but I've never made it before. I've never tasted it before, probably for good reason. It seems to be a little on the spicy side, and I'm not crazy about overly spicy foods. But I figured if it's in the world's top 10, I probably should know how to make it. Now, the first thing I have to do is make a spice mix called garam masala. I can probably buy it somewhere in this city, but I don't know where to look. Whole Foods might have it, but that'll be very expensive. Alton Brown published on the internet a formula that he uses for making garam masala, spice mix. The difference is he uses whole seed spices. I have nearly everything I need, but it's all ground. He roasts his seeds in a, a uh, cast iron skillet. I'm going to fudge as best I can. I'm going to substitute ground spices for, for whole seed spices, and we'll see what I come up with. So let's make the garam masala first. So Alton Brown's formula is two tablespoons of cardamom seeds, two tablespoons coriander seeds, one tablespoon cumin seeds, one tablespoon brown mustard seeds, two tablespoons black peppercorns, 20 cloves, one dried arbol chili, stemmed, seeded, and crumbled, and then one two and a half inch cinnamon stick broken in half, and then finally one teaspoon freshly grated nutmeg. I'm going to toast the whole herbs about three to four minutes, but I'm also going to toast the ground herbs after the whole herbs are done. And I'm just going to swish those around in the pan until I start to smell them cooking. So let's get these whole herbs in there. This is actually the cardamom seeds and the peppercorns. What I'm doing here is just kind of shaking my seeds around, flipping them over. I want to toast those as evenly as possible. These are starting to brown quite a bit now, so I'm t I just turned my heat off. I'm going to transfer these to a metal bowl. Bring my heat back up. And then I'm going to put my Whoa, look at that smoke. And that, I figured, was going to heat up very quickly. You want to just swish this around and get that toasted very quickly. And then get it right out of a pan. Look how dark that is. So these have had a chance now to cool down. I'm curious to see how these are going to grind up in here. Put the lid on, press the button. They're grinding up. Okay, now with all that pepper in there, when I take this lid off, I know I'm going to start sneezing. Let's see what happens. So now there are my herbs. Wow, that has a strong aroma. I gotta say though, it smells good, but it is strong. Okay, I'm gonna transfer this now to a jar. According to Alton Brown, this can be stored in an airtight jar up in the cupboard for up to one month. So there it is, my what my, I guess, this is my best guess on what would be a garam masala. Next, I have to make a marinade for the chicken. What I'm finding with all these recipes, and I've researched a lot of recipes, is that there is no one formula for how to make 
this dish. It's not like tiramisu with this kind of one procedure. It's made the same way almost every single time. There's all kinds of different ideas out there on how to make a chicken tikka masala. The recipe I'm working with calls for marinating the chicken for three to six hours, preferably overnight. So I'm actually starting the evening before to make my marinade and to start marinating my chicken. I'm going to let it marinate overnight and then tomorrow I'll start cooking. So let's prepare the marinade. Into a bowl I'm going to put one cup. This is about 237 milliliters. I don't know what this weighs. I don't know whether you weigh where you live, whether you weigh or measure yogurt. But this is plain yogurt. And use a good quality yogurt if you can. And then I need about two tablespoons of lemon juice. So I walked up to my neighbor's yard and picked a lemon off of her tree. Because she says, come get lemons whenever you want. Because she doesn't use them and they just end up on the ground. Oh, look at how juicy these are. And there's a train going by. One person commented on my YouTube videos that he doesn't mind the sound of the trains and planes at all. He says it adds atmosphere. If you call that atmosphere, I call that noise. But there you go. Train. This is a trailer park. It's near the tracks. <laughs> okay. Two tablespoons. There's one. And two. That's almost all of that. Wipe my hands here. I'll clean up this mess later. I end up getting more juice on the counter, I think, than I get into the bowl. Okay, so that's two tablespoons of lemon juice, two teaspoons of ground cumin, two teaspoons of red pepper, two teaspoons of black pepper, one teaspoon of cinnamon, one teaspoon of salt, and then finally one teaspoon of fresh minced ginger. Stir all that up. At least I'm not sneezing. Pepper does make me sneeze. Get that all blended together. And that is my marinade for my chicken. So next I want to start preparing my chicken meat. I've switched to my chicken board here. I have one board that I used just for chicken. As far as what chicken meat to use, different recipes have different suggestions or requirements. Some say to use breast meat, some say to use dark meat, leg meat. I'm using thigh meat. Some use either or, some use both. Again, we're not dealing with one specific classic way, as far as I can see, on how to make chicken tiki, tikka masala. I, I bought the thighs with the bone in and the skin on because I think it's the most economical way to buy this chicken. I'm all about saving money if you can. I'm just going to remove the skin, the bones and the skin. I'm going to set aside and freeze those because I can use those for making stock. I put that in the freezer and when I get enough of it, I make chicken stock. I always have lots of chicken stock in the freezer. That's one of the best, I think, ingredients to have in your kitchen is homemade chicken stock. And what I'm going to do here, I know I need one and a third pounds, about 600 grams of chicken meat. So I'm going to start 
preparing these thighs. And when I get roughly my one and a third pounds, I will stop. So there's one of my chicken thighs. Work on the next one. I'm on my fourth thigh here. This is going to give me what I need. So these are four fairly large chick chicken thighs. Got a digital scale there. And that's about one pound five ounces. So that's pretty much pretty close to what I what I need for my chicken meat. I'm putting a rubber glove on because I don't want to get this spice mix in my skin. Put your chicken in there. Get it all buried in that spice mix with the yogurt and everything and all the herbs. And then you want to cover this and let it marinate for at least three to six hours. As I said, I'm going to marinate this overnight. Okay, so now we are at day two. My chicken has been marinating in the refrigerator overnight. And for those of you who measure things by weight rather than volumetrically, I did weigh a cup of yogurt. It came in at eight and a half ounces, about 240 grams. Okay, so now what I want to do next is I want to make the sauce. And I'm going to prepare the sauce almost to the end. I'm going to leave a little bit undone. I want to prepare it to a point at which I can add the cooked chopped chicken and then reheat the sauce, finish it with cilantro and lemon juice, and then I'm ready to serve. So let's start making the sauce. I've got a large pot heating on the stove here. I'm going to be putting in, I don't know, a tablespoon or two of clarified butter. I clarify my own butter. I'm using clarified butter because it has a higher smoke point. It won't burn like extra virgin olive oil would. You can use regular olive oil if you wanted to. Canola oil, vegetable oil. Save the extra virgin olive oil for flavoring. And of course whole butter because it has milk solids in it will turn brown and burn at higher temperatures. All right, and I'm gonna add my onions to this. Eight to nine ounces of onion. 225 to 255 grams. And I'm going to start these at medium high and after a few minutes I'm going to reduce the temperature down to about medium low, even low. And I want to, I don't want to caramelize these, but I don't want them just cooked to the point at which they're tender and translucent. I want them just lightly golden. So that'll take about 10 minutes. In the meantime, now I want to puree my plum tomatoes. Not thoroughly pu puree them. I don't want to turn them into a smooth puree. A little chunky is okay. So I'm doing that in a blender. This is a, pretty much the only thing that I use my blender for. My lid on. I'm just going to blend this for a few seconds. Just like that. So hopefully I've preserved a little bit of chunkiness in there and it's not too smooth. That's all I really need for my tomatoes. So you can see my onions now have started to brown fairly well. They're not caramelized. And now to that I want to add a couple of cloves of fresh garlic, minced. I'm going to run them through my garlic press, like so. Beautiful. 
And then I'm going to add a couple of teaspoons of freshly minced ginger. And I want to cook this for about a minute or two just to get the, mostly to get the garlic cooked up. Now I'm ready to add my tomatoes. Beautiful. And then I'm going to squeeze in there about a tablespoon of tomato paste. This was actually the leftover from a can of tomato paste and I sealed it on a plastic bag and kept it refrigerated. I'm gonna get that stirred together. I'm gonna bring my heat up to medium now. And hopefully you can see that there are some chunks of tomatoes in there. So I didn't pure that, pure that, puree that down too much. There's a couple of nice chunks of tomatoes. It's going to give the sauce a little bit of texture. Now I'm going to add my spices to this. So I'm going to add one teaspoon of ground coriander, uh, one half teaspoon of ground cumin, one teaspoon of paprika, Stir that because that's starting to bubble. If I let it bubble too much, it'll splatter onto my stove. Turn my heat down a little bit. Okay, that was the paprika. One half teaspoon of turmeric. I'm adding that mostly for the color. This is my one teaspoon of my garam masala that I made yesterday. You could add two teaspoons if you like it really spicy. And then what I did optionally is I bought some Arbol chilies and I cut up two chilies after I removed the seeds and the white vein inside and I chopped that up. That's kind of like red pepper flakes. That, that's from two of those dried chilies. Okay, so I want to bring this up to a boil over medium low heat and then I'm going to cover this and I'm going to simmer this for 15 to 20 minutes. All right my sauce now has been cooking for about 20 minutes and that's not too thick. I did put a cup of chicken stock to one side to water this down some if I thought it became too thick in 20 minutes. So now I want to add to this one cup which is 237 milliliters of heavy cream. Stir that in. I have this off the heat now. I turn the heat off because this isn't quite done yet. I have to finish this with the coriander and the chicken and so forth. And I know this is going to need some salt. So I have my red handle tasting spoon ready. It'll be spicy but it probably won't be salty enough. <laughs> that is surprisingly good. I was expecting to gag and choke and cough. I want to add about a half a teaspoon or so of salt to that. I'm really surprised how good that tastes. I think it's the cream. Cream has a tendency to smooth things down. One thing I'm worried about though right now is I was planning to put some lemon juice in this, but will the lemon juice curdle the cream? Very likely. I'm going to put a little bit aside and just test with some lemon juice, and if it does, I'm not going to add any lemon juice. Okay, that's pretty good. Might use a little bit of salt. I have one friend who adds a lot of salt to his food, but I prefer food with low salt. So I'm going to leave that as is. I'm going to cover this and set this aside and then I can start working on my chicken. 
So I took my chicken out of the refrigerator now. And what I'm going to do with each of these pieces is scrape off what I can of this marinade. In the meantime, I'm heating a grill on my stove, my cast iron stovetop grill. You can pan fry this chicken, you can broil it under the broiler, you can cook it on a barbecue grill. I'm going to use my stovetop grill. I lubricated my grill with safflower oil because it has a high smoke point. And I'm actually going to dip my chicken in a little bit of safflower oil as well just to make sure that I have no sticking or as little sticking as possible and then place that on the grill. And once you put this on the grill, move it around as little as possible if you want bar marks, those lines in your chicken. And I'm going to cook these for about five minutes on one side. And then I'll turn them over and then with a, my digital thermometer, I'll check the internal temperature. I want to cook these to an internal temperature of about 160 degrees Fahrenheit, which is about 71 degrees Celsius. That's a safe temperature for chicken. I'm ready to turn these over now. I went six minutes. Got some sticking on there, but that's all right. I expected some because of that coating. The part of the grill that's right over the stove burner, that's going to be the hottest and that's going to give me my nicest bar marks as you can see there. I think I'm going to switch these. and put these on the hot part of the grill and move these to the cooler. All right. Now, as I said, I want to start using my digital thermometer and I want to check right below the surface. That's only 132 degrees, 133 degrees right now. I'm going to bring these up to 160 degrees, 71 degrees Celsius in the thickest part of the meat. While my chicken finishes cooking, I want to talk about the rice that I'm going to put the chicken on. It's very common to serve chicken tikka masala on a bed of rice, such as basmati rice. What I want to do when I do something this fancy, I want to make a fancy rice to go under the dish. So I'm going to do a three part rice. I'm going to start off cooking brown rice and wild rice. I'm going to cook that for about 30 minutes and then I'm going to add white rice to that for the last 15 minutes of cooking. That'll absorb the remaining liquid and then I'll have a three variety rice that I can put my chicken on top of. It should look really nice. I've brought some homemade chicken stock up to the boil. I'm going to be adding a good dab of butter to that. I'm only going to be making a small amount of rice because I only need enough to plate and do my photography for the day. If you're planning to feed four to six people, I would figure three quarters of a cup each of the three rices. That's about five ounces or 142 grams and then about four and a half cups or about one liter of liquid. You can use water. You can use water with a little bit of chicken bouillon in it. I'm using homemade chicken stock. So there's my brown rice going in, my wild rice going in. I'm going to bring that back up to a boil, cover that, and I'm going to set a timer for 30 minutes. Okay, that's just coming to the boil. 
Oh, and I'm going to reduce my heat to low. While my rice is cooking, I'm going to cut up my chicken. It's had time to cool. I had a little taste of this chicken, by the way. It is good. If you like spicy food, you will like this. So I'm cutting these into pieces that are kind of large. I'm going to put those in my sauce. And I'm not going to do much with them just yet. Oh, and I wanted to mention I did a little test. I put some of that sauce in a bowl and I put fresh lemon juice in it. The cream did not curdle. Once it's mixed in with the other ingredients, it should be okay. You can see how some of that is already separating. That's what happens with dark meat because it's composed of smaller muscles. But I love the looks of this because I like the grill marks in it. I think it's going to add an interesting look to my chicken tikka masala. And as I said, I'm not going to do much with this yet. I'm just going to wait until my rice is done and then I'll heat. I'm going to give this a stir. Then I'll heat this up. I'll add some lemon juice and some chopped cilantro to it and I'll be ready to serve this over rice. <laughs> Isn't that looking fantastic already? My rice is just about done so I want to do some finishing here. I'm plucking some leaves off of some cilantro. Another flavor that I'm not enamored of. It tastes like soap to me. I know a lot of people like cilantro, so I'm not going to complain. Although if I want the flavor of soap, I can just suck on a bar of soap. I just want to give this kind of a coarse chop. This doesn't have to be real fine. And I think that will be good enough right there. Put that in a bowl. And then I'm ready to start bringing up my heat under my chicken tikka masala. As soon as the rice is done, the chicken will be hot. And we'll be ready to serve. Now how I would plate this is put a nice bed of my three variety rice. Doesn't that look beautiful? I love that rice. I just really like that rice. And I heated my chicken tiki masala up. Plenty of that on top. And the last step, of course, is to see how good that tastes. Okay, if this tastes as good as it smells. Oh, that's so good. And this is really mild now. If you wanted to really ramp this up with heat, you could add jalapeno pepper to it, red pepper. I don't like things too spicy hot. First, I want to taste some of my rice with my sauce on it. That's very good. That is very good. See, it's not overly spicy for me. And some of my chicken. Oh. <laughs> that is very good. Okay. Excuse me. I gotta go enjoy my chicken tikka masala. For a printable PDF copy of this recipe with step-by-step -step photographs, visit the White Trash Cooking website and look on the home page or in the recipe archive.